So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Bill McCarthy as our first speaker. He's uh, got the toss, and he'll be opening five minutes for opening comments. By the way, both you guys, there's the timer. They'll hold up the signs, and when it says stop, stop, otherwise. I got lots of sheriffs in here, <laughs> a lot of deputies. Okay, Bill? Hi, uh, hi, I'm Bill McCarthy. Um, and, and I am running for sheriff of Polk County, uh, asking to be reelected to that position. Is the microphone sound okay? Y'all hearing him? Okay. Um, and uh, I'm just to talk a little bit about my background and, and my development was I, I uh, joined the United States Marine Corps in 1966 and finished my high school program at the Army Navy Academy there at the Marine Corps. Um, I then uh, did like everybody else boot camp ITR and went to Vietnam and then went to Vietnam again for two tours. I was there for the Tet Offensive. And, uh, and left uh, in late 1968. Uh, it, was a, it was an unbelievable experience. I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world, uh, but, I, but I think it gave me a pretty good understanding of people and, and some of the difficult situations that we find ourselves in. When I came back, um, I applied for the uh, Des Moines Police Department, but was not old enough. You had to be 21. Uh, I applied then for the Polk County Sheriff's Office and was hired there. I spent just a brief period of time uh, with Wilbur Hildreth and company. And uh, as soon as I was eligible, I applied for Des Moines. They were in the process of hiring an additional 200 officers because we had just entered into the, to the phase where we had the drug culture that was, uh, that was developing the youth culture for those who are baby boomers and remember that, the anti-war movement and the civil rights movement. And we lived with that well into the early 70s. And it was a, it was a pretty tumultuous time. Uh, I think a lot of people felt at that time that, that maybe the, the fabric of the country was coming apart, but it turned out that we were a lot stronger than what we thought we were and, and a better days came, uh, came about. Um, I as I said, started the Des Moines Police Department with the high school education. I, I realized after having been there about a year that I, I wanted to move up the ranks a little bit. I wanted to better myself within the agency. I wanted to have more say over what was occurring. And uh, so I signed up for Area 11. And uh, even though it took me longer than two years on a part-time basis, I completed that associate's degree, went on to Drake University, completed a, a four-year degree in criminal justice, and then subsequently uh, obtained my master's degree uh, in public administration with an emphasis on state and local government. During the intervening years, I've also was selected to attend the FBI's Law Enforcement Executive Development Seminar program, I should say, and, uh, and attended that and completed it. I, I went to the Police Executive Research Forums uh, program at, at the John F. Kennedy School of Government in Boston at, uh, at Harvard and, uh, and completed that as difficult as that program was and then have done many things along the way to try to improve myself constantly applying for higher positions sergeant, lieutenant, captain, assistant chief and then eventually was appointed chief uh, at the Des Moines Police Department and after 37 years as chief I was approached by Bob Rice and Dennis Anderson and asked if I'd be willing to, to, uh, to, to leave and come to the Des Moines Police Department or the Polk County Sheriff's Office. And I did uh, think that over for quite some time and I decided that I would run for sheriff. They felt that there was, while they had very good people within the office, they didn't have people that were in a position to take, a, to take that final leadership executive level step. And so I, I ran for that office, and uh, I, I think I was the highest vote getter during that session in, in uh, Polk County. And have been there now almost four years. We've taken on some big things in the office, uh, big programs, probably more than what we should have, and I'll talk about those as the, the night wears on. I, I also uh, want to take a second before my time's up to thank Marty, the, the Des Moines Neighbors Association, and, uh, and uh, I want to thank Walt Tamanga for, for standing in for me. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Dan uh, for 
what we've got here and for the interest that he's developed in the race. I guess I've got 30 seconds left. Uh, I'm going to have to get used to that without breaking my train of thought. But, uh, <laughs> but, but having said that, I'm hoping we can stick to the issues. I know Dan has had a pretty open forum for the last year and a half, and I've pretty much, with, with a few exceptions in democratic circles, kept my mouth shut. And, and I'm, I welcome tonight, and I welcome the opportunity to discuss with him some of the things that, that I want to do and some of the things that he's brought up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dan, you've got five minutes. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I appreciate all the support here and the interest in Polk County. It's very important about this constitutional sheriff's race that we have. There's a lot of issues on the board. Um, I want you to know that I uh, was born and raised in Sterling, Illinois, up through seventh grade. I moved here in eighth grade. My dad was transferred in the airlines. Um, in eighth grade, I went to Grandview Park Baptist. From there, I went to Faith Baptist Bible College in Ankeny, Iowa. From there, I joined the military and went to Fort Benning, Georgia, and then the 7th ID Light Infantry Cohort Unit out in Fort Ord, California. From there, I tested for the largest sheriff's office in the, in the world, which is LA County Sheriff's. We tested with 5,000 people. Um, I was one of the 150 that was selected. We worked in Los Angeles throughout the Rodney King incident. Uh, that was three weeks of rioting. We went through that, and then I lateraled to Pomona Police Department where we worked for an additional couple of years. From there, I moved back home and uh, tested for the Polk County Sheriff's Office. Bob Rice hired me. I've been doing this for about 15 years in Polk County, about 23 years total. I've been married about 23 years. I have three great teenagers. One's in college and two are here at home. My mom and dad are from this community. I grew up in this community. I love this community. Um, I'm not going to take the five minutes because we need to get into the issues, but I appreciate your support. Thank you very much for the volunteers that came and started this neighborhood association tonight, and we'll look forward to chatting and answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. First question, and this will be directed to Dan. Uh, this will be for two minutes. Thank you. Two minutes. How will you further develop community relations between the sheriff's office and the citizens of Polk County? Bob Rice, who hired me, was phenomenal at community relations. He had about six people in a community relations unit. There's many different organizations in your community that want to give back to the sheriff's office, help out, mentor, volunteer, etc. We're down to one person in community relations. That's unacceptable. By taking some top-heavy brass and reallocating them to lower positions, we'll be able to put some much-needed personnel and community relations and join together the communities, which is needed for quite some time. Thank you. Bill, same question. How will you further develop community relations between the sheriff's office and the citizens of Polk County? Well, I, I think there's a tried and tested process for doing that. And the first is that the sheriff or the chief of police has to be open and transparent. Yeah as much as possible and have an open door policy. And I've had that, whether I'm at Des Moines or at the Polk County Sheriff's Office. The second thing you have to do is, is make sure that you stay in touch with the various ethnic and neighborhood groups that exist within your community. That's no small assignment. That, that means a considerable amount of weekends and evenings where you're going to go to their events and meet with them and be present and just be seen and talk and listen to what they have to say, and you have to work at that every single month. And I have done that faithfully. Uh, that's why I think I have the, the support of, of the, most of the ethnic groups within the community, quite frankly. Um, it's, it's, when, when there are budget constraints and, and limitations placed on a sheriff's office, uh, anybody in law enforcement will tell you that one of the first areas that goes is your police community relations. You may want to put six people in that capacity, but if you don't have the budget or if other things are more important, such as patrol or, or uh, functioning the jail in a safe and secure way, you're going to have to limit that to what your budget dictates. You can talk about the things you're going to do, but you've got to have the budget to do it. Thank you. Next question. What proactive approaches would you support to encourage non-criminal activity in our youth population? 
and Bill, that will be you first. Well, these, again, these are, these are not new ideas. But I think it takes community involvement. Uh, and, and it takes, a, 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 and not only in, in the things that are talked about in the schools, and, and the, uh, but, but most particularly the sports programs that all of us volunteer. I was president of South Des Moines Little League, a huge program for five years, strictly volunteer, several thousand kids, and, uh, and, and that made a difference. We also worked very hard at, at trying to make sure that the laws that are legislatively passed give a certain protection to the kids in terms of money for after school programs and tutoring and mentoring and things of that nature. These are things we might take for granted, but they actually have to come from some allocation of money. And then I think also what the churches do and commit to is important. And, uh, and the role and relationship that the officers have with the youth in their districts are important as well. Thank you. Thank you. Dan, same question. What <clears throat> proactive approaches would you support to encourage non-criminal activity in our youth population? On my website, we have an issue called Share with the Sheriff. I want to do this on a monthly basis at a venue like this, a church, a park, et cetera, to get the concerns of the community from all the different ethnic backgrounds and bring them together and discuss issues. One of the biggest issues is our youth. The bottom line is our Explorer Post program for the Sheriff's Office has drastically dropped in the last four years. That's unacceptable. With Bob Rice, it was a large group of people. It's steadily going down. You cannot expect the youth to want to do what we do and, and be a part of law enforcement when they're not uh, welcomed with open arms and we're not increasing that particular thing to get juveniles to understand what law enforcement does. Thank you. Uh, next question, and this will be for you, Dan. Would you support stand your ground legislation as sheriff? Yes, I would. That simple. Bill? No, I, I don't support that. I, I think it's, it's splitting hairs too much. It takes away the discretion of the investigators who have some experience on What's, what's actual protection and what's aggression. And it also takes away those prerogatives from the county attorney that, that ultimately makes that decision by way of the charge or not. It also allows, uh, as our Polk County attorney has said, it would allow for some victims in demo, uh, domestic uh, 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 abuse circumstances to be further abused and to, be, uh, to, to have somebody be aggressive towards them. It's not good legislation. On the surface, it sounds good. You have a right to protect yourself. But, you know, as opposed to hurting somebody, as opposed to, uh, to, to, to the damage that can be caused uh, and the pain and suffering to the families, what's the matter with asking us to back up? If you have to back up to the wall, then you don't have to back up anymore. And obviously, you retaliate at that point. But let's not, let's not give people a free hand to be violent and mean-spirited to others. Thank you. Okay, next question. And uh, Bill, this will be for you. Uh, what would you do to better equip the 911 communication center, and particularly in the area of training and working conditions? We have embarked in Polk County on a plan uh, to, to improve our communication system. It's a multi-million dollar effort. It, it is one that has been uh, 10 years in the making, and we just got approval from the board of directors to move into phase one. And what that will mean is additional towers, better coverage. Polk County Dispatch Center dispatches for 15 fire department and 15 police department. We're going to make sure that those fire and those police agencies that we dispatch for can talk to each other. It's called interoperability. In addition to that, when we move into phase two with what they call a P25 capability, we're going to be able to communicate freely and openly at a key, at a key stroke by a dispatcher with Des Moines Dispatch Center and subsequently their police officers and WESCOMs, which means West Des Moines, Urban, Dillon, and Clive. So at that point, we will have a situation that, that is the best of the best within the country in terms of being able to protect ourselves against man-made uh, disasters or natural disasters. The communication is essential, 
and we've spent a lot of time and effort under Scotty uh, Locker, Major, Major Locker's effort to, to get to the point we're at now. Thank you. Uh, what would you do to better equip the 911 Communication Center training working conditions? Dan? Well, we've had a mandatory overtime issue in several divisions of the Sheriff's Office because of staff issues. That's one of them. Um, they're extremely short down there. They're working extra days. They're fatiguing. They're calling in sick. The bottom line is we need more staff down there. That's the first issue. If you control the morale of your 911 dispatchers, obviously they can be better served to the community. So in addition to that, by taking some of the upper management positions that are in dispatch and moving them to different divisions and putting more dispatchers down there along with clerical staff that can run no contact orders, that can answer the phones, et cetera, your 911 dispatch center would run a lot smoother. Uh, we are overdue on these towers and this 911 system. We're 10 years behind from the West Coast and the East Coast. We're in the step in the right direction, but it's taken too long. It's, it's, uh, it's a miracle somebody hasn't gotten hurt with the staff as well as the citizens. Thank you. <clears throat> the next, turn up the sound a little bit. Well, whoever is controlling the sound, they adopt just a little bit. We're getting a little bit of feedback. That's also part of a problem too. This will be uh, for Dan on this question. He'll do this one first. Iowa Code 341A is the cornerstone of the Office of Sheriff. The law provides regulations for hiring, firing, and promotion of employees within the Sheriff's Office. What will you do as Sheriff to ensure that this law is upheld? First of all, I won't allow that law to be broken. It's clear that the civil service laws is supposed to make a list of the top 10 and certify that list for approximately two years. At no time do you bring the county attorney's office into it and bring the civil service commissioners and say we're just going to put everybody on the list. That's intentionally breaking the civil service law. I've been victim to it myself. Three out of the last four years I've tested number one for lieutenant. I'm still a sergeant. The, the current practice is unacceptable. What we do with the civil service laws, we're not into manipulating those laws. We're into honoring the Iowa Code in 341. Thank you. Next, uh, back to Bill, same question. Iowa Code 341A is the cornerstone of the Office of Sheriff. The law provides regulations for hiring, firing, and promotion of the employees within the Sheriff's Office. What will you do as Sheriff to ensure that this law is upheld? I'll try to get through this fairly quick because it's a complicated issue. but. Uh, when I came to the sheriff's office, and I've been here now, you know, a little over four years, approaching five, I think, I didn't know the people that worked within the agency. I mean, I, I've known officers from this agency in the past, but I didn't know them personally. And I know they had a system in the past where the sheriff made the promotion from the list provided by the Civil Service Commission. I couldn't do that, in all honesty. I don't know these people, and I don't know how they relate to the agency, how they fit in, whether they work, whether they lay down, whether they're a problem, whether they're not. So I set up a process. It's based on best practices, and, and the applicant has to get on the civil service list, and once that's done, they submit those lists to 10 to us. We can pick anybody off that list. We can pick number 10 if we want. Being first on that list that doesn't mean a darn thing. They're not submitting the list in terms of who they think is Keep best the comments and who down, they folks. think is 10th. What they're doing is saying to me, here's 10 qualified names, and we've tried to filter out the politics. And then we sit down and interview the applicant, and we look at their personnel file and their complaints and their history and their work ethics and the things that they've done, and we've had the commanders interview these people. And they get to speak to us and make a statement. Then we vote, and the person individually with the smallest vote is number one off that list by the sheriff, number two, number three, number four, number five. And you know, sometimes when people don't get promoted, there's a reason behind that too. Folks, I'm serious. You want to applaud, that's fine. Neither side, any comments from the audience? Thank you. Do the traffic cameras, this will be for uh, uh, Dan. 
No, sorry, Bill. Mm -hmm. This will be for Bill. Do the traffic cameras make our streets safe, safer? If so, how? If not, why do we have them? Well, we, we don't have them yet. But I have made a recommendation to the Board of Supervisors to, to employ uh, uh, mobile cameras. Now, I'm not talking about fixed cameras, and I'm not talking about stoplight cameras. I'm talking about fixed speed cameras. If you look at our statistics over the past five years, the, the single thread that runs through the fatalities and the serious accidents and the injuries and, and the deaths is speed. And the deaths have involved a number of students, particularly from Southeast Polk and in the Bondurant area and Altoona and Ankeny. And, and I think with the uncertainty of the location of the cameras that it can make a difference. We have some indication of that from Des Moines. We have some indication of that from Cedar Rapids. And there's a, a study out of Missouri University and Texas A&M which, which seems to verify that. Now whether that actually pans out or not, I don't know. But we're going to embark on those cameras if, if it's something that we can put together and set in motion. The companies that do these things don't charge us anything for coming in and doing it. They do, they do take a substantial portion of the fine, but there's no upfront cost to us. Furthermore, if the legislature ever outlaws them, and that's a, that's a possibility, they pack up and they leave with, without any penalty to us. I think it's worth, if we can save some lives, I think it's worth it. As far as the constitutional argument that people mislead you on, it's a civil infraction. The Constitution and, and the Sixth Amendment and those other amendments that may or may not apply, apply to the criminal prosecution where you can be put in jail, not somebody getting in your pocketbook. So you, we can talk apples and oranges, but the reality of it is I want to give these a shot. I hope they save some lives. Thank you. Uh, Dan, same question. Do traffic cameras make our streets safer? If so, how? If not, why do we have them? Regardless of the statistics, a constitutional sheriff honoring his oath of office is going to look at the Sixth Amendment and say you have a right to face your accuser. If it wasn't a speed issue, why do they let you go 11 miles an hour over the speed limit? You could, if you had a fat pocketbook, you could speed through that camera zone 365 days a year and there would be no penalty other than you paying a check. So it's not about safety. I'm not going to go into the details of what I feel that about that anymore other than the fact that it's on my website and the bottom line is we've got four people running the entire county other than Grimes and Bondurant and I'm sure people would rather have a patrolman out there than a camera taking pictures of them. Thank you. Okay, next question. And Dan, this is for you first. What are your thoughts on how you would cut costs in the sheriff's office? We're over two and a half million upside down, I understand. Um, the bottom line is we have one civil service supervisor to 2.25 deputies. The national average is well over one to 10 from a squad size formation in the military. That's unacceptable. The, what that means is we've got about 40 civil service supervisors and half of them aren't managing anybody. So when you, when you reallocate those positions in these much needed positions like an interdiction unit, a gang unit, um, a traffic unit, et cetera, you can reallocate funding and economically ultimately save the taxpayers money. Thank you. <clears throat> Bill, to you, what are your thoughts on how you would cut costs in the sheriff's office? We're, we're not, first off, we're not two and a half million dollars down. We're, we're operating within budget. The Polk, Polk County Board of Supervisors has a certain revenue base and they distribute it among agencies and departments. We'll operate within that figure that they gave us. We made budget last time. We'll make budget next time. Secondly, our budget's $47 million. I've listened to Dan say this for a year and a half. It's $47 million, and we have about $12 million in revenue. So our budget, the actual cost to the taxpayers is about $34 million, which is a lot, but we're the biggest agency uh, of a sheriff's office. The other thing is I've listened to Dan for a year and a half distort deliberately the two-and-a-half ratio that he talks about as management to supervisor. We have a situation that he knows. He's talking about 
organizational relationship of a position, in other words, sworn personnel, detention officers, clerical, janitorial, the people in the law enforcement side manage all of those. If you just take the management of the law enforcement, you got a one to two and a half ratio. But when you have managers that manage each and every division and unit and section of their law enforcement, that becomes, that it's really span of control is what he's talking about. He just apparently doesn't understand the management issues or the, the, uh, the, the, the words that go along with what we use to describe what we do. We have a one in 10 in, in, uh, in, in court services. We have a one in nine in the civil division. We have a one in seven in patrol services. And if you add in the sergeants that are there on the street with their men, it turns to one in 10. So this is just an absolute falsehood, and I'm tired of hearing it. You want to make a comment? Like I said before, there's 130 civil service employees. The ratio is exactly that. I'm not talking about civilians in the jail. Actually, the civilians in the jail is a lot closer to the, the national average. The civil service employees is out of control. We've yeah. had, since he's been in office, we've had 22 people promoted to supervisors and hired only eight deputies. That's unacceptable. Oh, now, let me explain the rules to you. What we do allow on this forum is if there's an accusation back to a person, he was the second person, that he has a chance to be able just to give a quick response to it. And since it was an accusation that he doesn't understand it, he's had his chance to clarify it. So that's how it goes. Should the Polk County Sheriff's Office continue to charge an extra fee? Whoa, boy, this is a long one. Okay. This is really bad. I'm going to take my glasses off. Should the Polk County Sheriff's Office continue to charge an extra fee beyond the charge specified in the Iowa Code for a photo ID weapon permits, yet not allow an applicant to pay the statutory fee and receive a paper permit? Uh, if you understand that, uh, Dan, you're the first. No, Bill will be the first one on this one. Absolutely. Uh, Dan talks about the shortfall in the budget. Okay, Dan, you try to raise money on revenue side where you can. We spend a lot of money doing gun permits, and I know you can make the argument that, that you're going to be a constitutional sheriff, and I definitely need to address that in a little bit. But having said that, uh, it doesn't mean that, that the permit process ought to be free or it doesn't cost anybody anything. It costs the taxpayers a good deal of money. We charge, for a five-year permit, we charge $55. Of that, $10 goes to the state. We also do something in Polk County that no other sheriff's office does. This is the permit you get if you go apply any place else in, in the state. This is what we give you. And I'll guarantee you that virtually every single one of our permit holders prefer this card. They prefer to carry it in their billfold, and, they and they're proud of it. So we charge $5 for that. So now we have a full-time person that does this. It's supported by other staff within the office. In addition to that, every single year we do a check on these same applicants for the five years. So I just don't understand why the money we charge and the little bit we make to offset the expense to the county and to the taxpayers is such a big issue. Thank you. Dan? The money we make has been rumored to be seventy-five dollars to $100,000 a year. Nobody knows that other than Sheriff McCarthy and his accountant. If, if they're making that kind of money off a constitutional right to Second Amendment, that's unacceptable. That $5 extra charge for that machine has been paid for for several years. The Iowa statute says $50. That's what it should be. Thank you. And Dan, this will be to you first. How would you better utilize volunteers to supplement restorational justice? Restless, restorational? Restorative. Restorative, thank you. Did my wife read, write this? Oh, no. <laughs> okay. How would you uh, utilize volunteers to supplement restorative justice? Restorative justice concept is 
utilizing the community as well as local churches, et cetera, to come inside and mentor those individuals in the jails that maybe have made bad decisions and need to make better choices. I spoke to a young group of college students the other day and they were saying, how can we help? What can we do? And I told them about volunteering in the jail. There's plenty of churches, community groups. I want to triple the amount of volunteers that we have because the bottom line is these individuals, if we don't change their hearts and heads, they're going to come out and they're going to move in and they're going to be your neighbor someday. So instead of it being a revolving door, we need to analyze these restorative justice concepts and understand that when these people have taken, they need to give back to the community. Bill, do you want the question read again? No, I, it's restorative justice. Dan, you don't understand what restorative justice is. You need to get a book and look it up. Restorative justice is a concept that's used in the criminal justice system, and it provides an opportunity to restore or make whole. That's the theory behind it. We've used it in, in Iowa. We've used it in Polk County on occasion. One example is the uh, synagogue defacing that happened about 12 years ago that got a lot of press coverage, where you could bring those two young people, lost souls, if you will, that were under the influence of skinheads, and bring them in, and they sat down under the auspices of the county attorney and uh, Robert, Rabbi Fink, and, uh, and, and the, some of these folks that were still alive and had lived through the Holocaust were able to sit down and explain to them the impact their crime had upon them. And then these people had to try to make that right, these two lost souls. They had to paint over. They had to express themselves to the folks. Now, there's a place for that. It's called restorative justice. There's a place for that in our criminal justice system. But it isn't what Dan talks about. I don't know what he's talking about. But I can tell you this, and I, I'm serious about that. I can tell you this, that ask a lady that's been raped or if you've had your home burglarized, if you want to sit down across the table from a person that's perpetrated that violence against you and violated your inner space and see if she wants to have anything to do with a restorative justice approach. And Dan talks about being hard and, and on, the, on the criminals in terms of the projects. Well, you don't have a, a, a partnership with a restorative justice situation unless the police have first caught and apprehended and arrested and charged the criminal. So now the criminal has the incentive to say, gosh, I'm really sorry, and I, I really didn't mean to hurt your feelings. That's restorative justice. It's got to be done with great deliberation and care, and it's got to fit in the criminal justice system. That's restorative justice, Dan. Maybe you're talking about something else. <laughs>